10 years ago, the Deepwater Horizon oil rig exploded, releasing 800 million liters of oil out into the ocean. Emergency relief operations employed traditional methods to clean up the oil, including skimming, burning, and direct recovery of oil from the wellhead. But yet, at most, 30% of that oil ended up left in the ocean. You see, the main problem with oil spill cleanup is that the remaining oil forms emulsions, specifically oil and water emulsions. These occur when super tiny oil droplets become suspended within water, like this. These little droplets get everywhere, and once they're out, they spread out fast, making it really difficult to get them out of the water. This problem is also frequently exacerbated by the use of dispersants, a type of chemical that is used to prevent the oil from reaching shorelines, but actually in the process ends up dividing up the, the oil particles into even smaller droplets. Dispersants have also been found to make oil more toxic to certain ocean organisms. Luckily, there's a possible alternative. Ultrasonic sound waves. All right, so this may sound super fancy, but they're basically sound waves that are so high-pitched the human ear can't hear them. At a high enough frequency, they're also above the hearing of any ocean organism. But the cool part is, is that ultrasonic sound waves can actually separate oil from oil and water emulsions by causing the droplets to group together. How does this work? Something called standing waves. Standing waves exist when a sound wave is reflected off of another material, so that the highest point of the original wave lines up with the lowest point of the reflected wave. Rather than moving like this, they move like this. The cool thing about this is that standing waves can actually move objects floating in liquid and keep them in that position. You see, what I wanted to know was could these ultrasonic sound waves clean up the remaining oil left in the ocean that has formed these emulsions? You see, once the oil spreads out, over time, the proportion of oil to water becomes extremely small. But what if those little droplets could be pushed together so that the traditional methods that we have to clean up oil could be used? But of course, I first had to see if ultrasound even works best with small volumes of oil. That brings us to my research question. Which volume of oil, 0.2 milliliters or 2 milliliters in 100 milliliters of salt water, is most affected by the ultrasonic frequency of one megahertz? Basically, I compared one emulsion which contained a very, very small amount of oil with one that contained more oil. When I began this research project, I thought this question and the project in general would be completely manageable, maybe even almost too easy. You see, I just had to get that ultrasonic frequency working and I'd basically be set. And I found the way to do that pretty quickly through a little bit of research. It's called a transducer. This piece of equipment basically acts as a small speaker. It converts electricity into sound energy, which is emitted at an ultrasonic frequency. Once I had this, I thought, well, just one day of testing, right? And I could be set. I could look at all of that data and have my results and be easy, right? I think the most important thing I learned is that research is never that easy. I spent weeks messing with this piece of equipment, trying to get so much as a ripple in the water, before I realized several things. The first is that no matter how many 9-volt batteries you connect to this thing, it won't work. That's because transducers accept voltage at alternating current, not direct current, which is what batteries produce. I actually needed another piece of equipment, a function generator. This piece of equipment was insanely useful, but the most important thing is that it produced alternating current, and it also had the capability, it allowed me to manipulate the frequency of that alternating current. Why is that important, you ask? 
Well, the transducer not only accepts alternating current, but that alternating current has to be at the frequency the transducer is designed to produce. In other words, one megahertz. And not only that, but the transducer actually had to be in direct contact with the water, which can be a little bit complicated if on the underside of the transducer there are naked wires that if put in contact with water could possibly electrocute me. My solution? All of that weird colored stuff is this really cool material called Sugru. Basically, it starts out as a putty-like consistency, and then over time, it hardened into rubber, which made my setup watertight. After that, all I had to do was set up shop. I used a tripod and a camera to record before and after pictures, once ultrasound was applied for five minutes. And then to prepare the emulsions themselves, I stole various measuring cups from our kitchen and got to work. The emulsions themselves required a lot of mixing. First, salt and water, and then separately, oil and oil-based food coloring, so I could actually see if anything happened. And then I had to mix those two groups together using, yes, a drink frother, similar to what they use at Starbucks to put those fun bubbles in your drinks. Once I applied the ultrasound, here's what happened. Keep in mind, this video is sped up to 16 times its original speed, and it occurs over the course of five minutes. You can actually see a spot of clear water in the center starting to form. For visual reference, here's what it would look like if no ultrasound was applied. This is a smaller volume of oil, the 0.2% emulsion. But with ultrasound, you can actually see what appears to be some grouping of those droplets. Here's the control group for the 2% emulsion. But with ultrasound, visible grouping, and in fact, an area of clear water in the center around where the transducer is, which I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. <laughs> I conducted five trials for each of my test groups, but Besides the qualitative analysis, I had to get some quantitative data as well. So I looked at two different variables, the number of groups and the average size of those groups. I'll refer to those as particles from now on. You see, the best situation would be to see a decrease in the number of particles, but an increase in the average size of those particles. Because as they combine together, the globules be become bigger, but fewer. Luckily, I didn't have to actually count all those droplets by hand or measure them with a ruler. I used the software called ImageJ. Using this software, I was able to convert my images into pure black and white, and then the software itself collected the data that I needed. And here's what I found. For the number of droplets, I calculated the percent change between the before and after trials. The 0.2% oil emulsion actually showed an increase in the number of droplets, while the 2% emulsion showed that decrease. That decrease, remember, is what we wanted to see. Now, the average size of those particles was a little bit less interesting. Both showed an increase, and not by very much, let's just say. <laughs> But before I could make any conclusions, I had to determine if the differences between my test groups was statistically significant. To do that, I conducted a statistical analysis test called a t-test. Using that, I was able to determine that the difference between the number of droplets between my two different test groups was statistically significant. But the difference between the average area was not. Because the 2% test group showed a decrease in the number of particles, this suggests that the particles actually group together, while the 0.2% test group did not. In fact, the ultrasound may have actually had opposite the intended effect, dividing up the droplets. Therefore, the data suggests that ultrasound at one megahertz may be more effective at the higher concentration of oil. This finding is interesting, however, there are always some limitations. 
First and foremost, this study served as a proof of concept experiment. I wasn't actually out in the ocean spilling motor oil and causing oil pollution. I was up in my room with some tap water, table salt, and canola oil. Therefore, the variables present in the ocean, such as waves, ocean current, or like actual organisms, may change the conditions of using ultrasound. And crude oil may exhibit different characteristics than canola oil when ultrasound is applied. Additionally, the data that I took was collected from before and after pictures. So any objects other than the oil and water present in the pictures may have influenced results. Anything such as hair, reflections, or shadows that were present in the picture, the software could have picked up and counted as data. However, I minimized this with careful use of lighting, cropping of my pictures, and thoughtful administration of my procedure to prevent this as much as possible. However, there's always a likelihood that these objects were present and picked up by the software. So, ultrasound may not be viable for cleaning up emulsions that have a low oil content. So it wasn't the solution to the problem that I was looking at. But that doesn't mean that it couldn't be the solution to another problem. If ultrasound is more effective with higher volume oil and water emulsions, this means it could be more useful with initial cleanup of oil, preventing the oil from spreading out in the first place. Further research could optimize this solution, this technology, testing different volumes of oil, different frequencies, different lengths of time. You see, we may already have the technology necessary to eliminate pollution in our oceans. The possibilities are endless. Ultrasound could be used on plastic or other unwanted chemicals that have leached into our oceans. You see, the solutions already exist. We just have to find them. Thank you.